In this presentation, we're going to look at the figures of speech used within the Bible. Now, my goal is not to cover all the figures of speech used in the scriptures here in this presentation, but I want to expose you to this concept and give you some ideas about what to look for when you're studying the Bible. If you do not understand figures of speech, you can make some serious errors in Bible interpretation. Before we get into the details of this study, I want to remind you that you can go to YouCanStudyTheBible.com and read blog posts related to Bible study. There are written book reviews, software reviews, and even video reviews of software and books, as well as video training like you're watching right now. So make sure you check the site often to get the latest information to help you become a more prepared student of the Bible. Now what I want to do is begin by defining a figure of speech. And here is a great modern figure of speech that we use that will illustrate the point. Have you ever heard someone say, I'm sick as a dog? <laughs> what do they mean? Do they mean they have literally gotten sick while being a dog? No, they don't mean that they have become a canine. What they mean is that they are sick in much the way a dog gets sick. They say they're sick as a dog as a figure of speech. And we need to understand that these figures of speech provide a very powerful communication mechanism. Therefore, God has used them in His Word to communicate information to us in a very powerful way. So let's look at some common figures of speech that you'll find in Scripture. The first one is the simile. A simile can be defined as a figure of speech that compares one thing with another and typically uses a connector such as like or as. So, for example, a simile might be, His legs are like tree trunks. Now, are his legs literally tree trunks? No, they're like tree trunks in some way, probably in that they are large. Well, here's an example from Scripture. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. Was his word literally burning as a fire inside of me? No, his word wasn't literally burning fire. His word wasn't literally in my heart. My heart pumps blood. His word was in my innermost being. And it was like a burning fire, meaning that I felt it strongly and it had to come out. This is what Jeremiah was saying. This is an example of a simile in Scripture. Now let's look at another figure of speech, the metaphor. A metaphor is defined as an assertion that two things are the same, while they may in many ways be quite different. Linking words are not required. So while a simile uses like or as, a metaphor doesn't do that. A metaphor would simply say his legs are trees. Now obviously, a human would not really have legs that are trees. And so therefore, we would immediately understand that the speaker intended that to be a metaphor. Here's an example from Scripture. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 23, 1. Let me ask you, is the Lord literally a shepherd? Is he a human being who takes sheep from a pen to a pasture and from the pasture to the pen? No, he's not literally a human that takes care of sheep. But metaphorically, he is a shepherd. Why? Because he takes care of me. The metaphor is explained in the phrase, I shall not want. This is one of the most beautiful metaphors in all of Scripture. The Lord takes care of me. He leads me to pastures. He leads me by the still waters. There are so many beautiful, illustrative examples in Psalm 23. And this is a perfect example of the use of the metaphor. Now, the next figure of speech I'll look at is the allegory. An allegory is a longer, illustrative story intended to teach a moral or principle. Parables are often considered a type of allegory. You might think of an allegory as an extended metaphor. Instead of just saying something like, the Lord is my shepherd, we might use an entire story of a shepherd taking care of the sheep with the intention of illustrating what God does for us. Here's an example in Scripture, Luke 15, 11, And he said, A certain man had two sons. This is where a parable 
while fitting potentially under the umbrella of an allegory, is a very specific type of allegory. Because an allegory may use many different types of things to illustrate its point, but a parable in Scripture tends to be a realistic story. That is to say, we wouldn't say that there were 14 trees all standing in a field, and one tree said to the other tree something or another, and then say that we're telling a parable. In most cases, we would say that a parable is a realistic story. A realistic story is one like a certain man had two sons. One son did one thing, another son did another, and here's how the story unfolds. The point of the parable is to teach us at least one principle. There have been many arguments over the years as to whether a parable is intended to teach one moral or if there are many morals that we can get out of a parable. I think you can certainly get multiple beautiful points out of the parables of Christ. And I certainly think there seems to be one overarching moral of each parable. Whichever way you choose to look at it, it's important to understand that these are not necessarily meant to be understood as real historical events, but they're intended to teach us an important lesson. The next figure of speech is anthropomorphism. This one is very important to understand. It is the granting of human characteristics to non-human entities, or in the Bible, describing God with human features. The scripture teaches us clearly God is spirit. His very essence is spirit and not physicality as we have as human beings. Therefore, when the scripture gives to God the features or traits of a human, we would call this anthropomorphism. Here's an example. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. This is Proverbs 15 and 3. Does the Lord indeed see everything? Yes, he does. Why? Because he's omnipresent. He is everywhere at once. Because he is spirit, and he is not physical as I am, and I can only be in one place at a time. If he had physical eyes, well, those physical eyes would be constrained to the laws of physics and be able to be in only one place at a time. But because his eyes are spiritual eyes, or that's the way we think of it, to be able to understand God, then they are in every place. Does the Lord literally have physical eyes? Well, in the manifestation of Christ in the flesh, he certainly did, because he was fully man and fully God. But as a spirit, he has no physicality, and therefore he is able to see everything, everywhere, all at the same time. Now, the next one I'd like to talk about is hyperbole, or hyperbole, depending on how you choose to pronounce it. But here's the definition. It's the use of exaggeration to emphasize a point and paint a picture of greatness or extremes. In other words, we're going way beyond. For example, let's say that someone just became engaged and she presents her engagement ring for others to see. And another woman sees that ring and says, that rock is bigger than Mount Everest. Well, obviously, it's not really bigger than Mount Everest, is it? That's an example of hyperbole. Here's an example in scripture. Judges 20 verse 16 says, among all this people, there were 700 chosen men left-handed. Everyone could sling stones at an hair breadth and not miss. Now, is this meant to be taken literally, that when they sling a stone, they would absolutely never miss a hair at some distance? Well, certainly that is not the intention. This is hyperbole. It is intended to let us know they were extremely accurate when they would throw stones, or possibly use a slingshot when throwing stones. It is not intended to be a statement to be taken literally, but one to make the point that these men were extremely accurate in stone throwing. Finally, we have the concept of the paradox. A paradox is defined in literature and communications as a figure of speech that states the illogical to make a point. Jesus did this quite a lot in the Gospels. Here's an example. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 16 and 25. So he's stating something that seems impossible. If you lose your life, you'll find it. This doesn't even seem to make sense. 
that there's an important deep truth in it. He's taking the realm of the physical and the realm of the supernatural and eternal and he's bringing them together into one statement, which makes it appear to be illogical. But actually, the deep truth is that if we sacrifice the things of this life, we can have great things and great rewards in the life to come. Now, let me give you some closing suggestions in relation to the use of these various figures of speech in the study of Scripture. First of all, watch for figures of speech while you're reading. Pay close attention to them. And when you run into one, ask what does this figure of speech mean? In essentially literal translations like the English Standard Version, the King James Version, the New King James Version, consider a commentary that includes historical information. And this is really, really important for the King James Version because they may have translated some of these figures of speech using words in 1611 that may mean different things today or have a slightly different meaning than they did then. Sometimes they have a vastly different meaning. So having a good commentary that has background information can be very, very helpful in translating figures of speech when reading these. If you're reading a dynamic equivalent translation, be careful to test the interpretation for accuracy. Always remember that an essentially literal translation, or what's sometimes called a formal translation, is going to translate the Greek or the Hebrew to be as literal as possible as much as possible. But a dynamic equivalent translation will quite often give you somewhat of a literal translation, but then also add the interpretation that the translators thought was applicable. And sometimes it just gives you the interpretation and it doesn't give you the literal words of the original text at all. Dynamic equivalent would include things like the New Century Version, the Message and the New Living Translation and the NIV. So we want to make sure that we're understanding the figures of speech appropriately. Also, be prepared to explain the meaning of the figure of speech, particularly when new converts come into the church who've just been born into the kingdom. While they're reading through scripture, quite often they'll encounter these figures of speech and have questions about them. So make sure you're ready with an answer. You have the ability to explain to them what these figures of speech mean and the beauty of the literature in the scripture. And then finally, to get some practice, develop your own figures of speech to describe God and his word and other things in the Bible. Here's an example that might be very modern for you. His word is like Twitter. This is a simile, right? Notice the connecting word like. Well, what in the world could I mean by that? Certainly, it could be open to interpretation. And we could say, well, his word is like Twitter in that it's on the web. Well, that is true. But here's my meaning. The explanation, there's always something new. Every time I go to the Word of God, there's something wonderful and new there for me. As I study it, I get more and more knowledge of my wonderful Savior.